I'm Shane Morris with the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. How can a Christian artist break through in Hollywood? There may be no better person to ask than Devon Franklin, the producer of the surprisingly successful Heaven is for Real and the executive producer of the current hit Breakthrough. Today on the Breakpoint Podcast, Warren Cole Smith interviews Devon Franklin about his path to Hollywood and how he integrates faith, film, and storytelling. Devon, welcome to the program. And, you know, I want to talk about your new movie and, you know, all the other millions of things that you're involved with. But I want to start back maybe in your youth. You were raised by a bunch of women. Your, uh, <laughs> your parents divorced when you were young, and then your dad My mother. Passed. No, my, my dad died. They yeah, didn't your divorce. Dad died. They, oh, they did not divorce mm-hmm. before. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry I had that mistake. But he did die when you were real young, right? When I was nine years old, yeah. And, and you're now older than he was when yes, he died. Yes, four right? years older than he was when he died. Yes. I'm 40 years old now. So what was it like being raised by a bunch of women? It was awesome. I think it contributed to uh, the man I am today and, you know, being raised by my mother. You know, she's such a superhero, and um, the input of my— my grandmother and then my grandmother's seven sisters, uh, six of which are still alive today. The wow. oldest is uh, 92. The youngest is 72. Now, I read somewhere that your mom kind of, th- that that was a very intentional thing, that she kind of put together a coalition of yeah, these yeah, women yeah, yeah. to kind of For come sure. around you and your brothers. That's so right. That's sure right. Make sure that y'all were raised right. Yes, because she grew up in the house with them. So when she was born, she was raised in part by her grandmother, which was, um, you know, my great aunt's mother. And so when she was raised, grew up, she grew up with my grandmother's sisters as almost like another sister. So as we got older, you know, because she had such a close relationship with them, it was just an organic part of the process for them to have a close relationship with us. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing, you know, being able to still be in relationship with them today. That is amazing. And, well, you were also raised in the church as well, right? Yes. And that probably didn't hurt, right, in Mm-mm. terms of um, making didn't, sure that um, you had the right influences in your life? No, it didn't hurt at all. It truly was a blessing. You know, I think the church gave me a really strong foundation, not only just spiritually, but practically. I think so much of my work ethic, so much of the uh, my attitude and commitment to service comes from being raised in the church and serving every weekend. And your your pastor was um, also a member of your family. It was your uncle. Was yeah, right? yeah, he was my uncle by marriage. He still is my uncle, yep. uh, married to one of my great aunts. And you got to preach at a pretty young age. 15 years old, man. I didn't know what I was doing at all. Had no idea. But you wanted um, to preach. I mean, to me, I mean, I listen, I've been at this a while, you know, in Christian ministry. Nobody knows what they're doing when they're 15 years old. But the fact that you wanted to do it and that there yeah. was a place for you to do that, that must have been so formative for you. It was. I mean, the first youth day that our church did, my older brother um, spoke. And he, you know, he's more of a, he does more speeches and whatnot. So the second year when they asked me to speak, you know, I ended up, there was a book by Les Brown called Live Your Dreams. Les Brown is a, you know, a phenomenal motivational speaker. Been doing it for oh yeah, no, oh, I know man, him. Yep. 40 years, yep. I think, something like that. And in that first sermon, I probably quoted more from his book than, than scripture. Uh, but <laughs> it went well and people thought it, I did a good job and I was excited to do it. I mean, you know, I've been around the church my whole life, so speaking wasn't a foreign thing. However, I wasn't interested in doing that as my job as my profession. I mean, everyone, when they saw me preach, they were like, oh man, you got to become a minister. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to Hollywood. And I was pretty clear about that. And, uh, you know, that was, has certainly been a journey. And it's interesting over time, as I begin to incorporate ministry into what I do, you know, everyone starts to see, oh wow, got it. Now we see how all this can work together. But back then, nobody saw it that being in movies and also, you know, ministering would whatever coincide. Yeah. Speaking of Hollywood or the desire to go to Hollywood, that started pretty early for you as well, right? I mean, you started watching television, you started watching movies, yes. kind of dissecting them, right? That's taking, right. Taking them apart and figuring out what made them work. Totally. I was always watching films, movies like uh, Rocky, uh, The Color Purple, Back to the Future. Um, shows like A Different World, The Cosby Show, those entertainment stories just move me. And I was always fascinated with how do you do this? I mean, Star Wars, how do you how do you make these images come to life? How do you tell these stories? How do you create situations that are emotional, that move an audience? So these things always move me. And I was always fascinated by them and wanted to figure out how to do it. And that was one of my passions. 
and still is. And the opportunity to do it today is kind of mind blowing. Yeah. Well, before we get to today and some of the projects that you're working on now, I want to, yeah. if I could, just go back. Yeah. To let's that do era. it. So, so you're, you know, you're raised, um, you know, by all these women and the church, and you developed this passion for film and television and storytelling uh, pretty early on. And you say that you, you know, you're not going to go preach. You're going to go to Hollywood, and you go to USC, which is one of the top film schools in the country. But you majored in business with a minor in film. Do I have that? That's right. right. That's right. I majored in business, minor in film, not uh, because I wanted to. But I got rejected from the film school. So USC Film Schools is still, I believe, today one of the best film schools in the world. Yeah. And I applied, and they rejected me. Um, I got admitted general admission to the school, but I got rejected from the film school. And so as a result. I was like, okay, well, what am I going to major in? And I decided, I decided, well, you know, business is still a good major and supplement that with a film minor. And that same year, my freshman year, because I wasn't uh, in the film program, I had some more time on my hands. So I got an internship because I never, at that point, I never had any experience in Hollywood. So it, it's one thing to think you want to do something and have an intellectual desire, but you need to kind of complement that with the practical one to decide if this is really what you want to do. And so I got an internship working at Will Smith's um, uh, management company, and that was really my first entree into the business. And it was great to then have the you know intellectual education through school and the practical education through the internship, and that really gave me a very well-rounded educational experience. Well, and w- working with Will Smith is um, was formative for you as well because you got to be involved as a young executive in a couple of his more successful and more interesting projects, in my view. Uh, the, the, I mean, I think a lot of folks, uh, you know, kind of know Will Smith from, you know, Men in Black and sort of the action adventure and that kind of yeah. thing. And, and Or maybe from The Prince of Bel-Air. But he has done a lot of movies, too, that are intellectually and even spiritually challenging. Um, so, for example, Hancock and Happiness and uh, I Am Legend, even. Sure. There, there's some, there are real moral, philosophical, ethical dimensions to those movies. And you got to be involved with at least a couple of them didn't you yes i um after i was an intern for him for four i mean at his company for four years i became an assistant at his company and then i left to take a job as a development executive for a producer and then i took a studio job for mgm and then mgm got sold to sony pictures entertainment so when i went to sony pictures entertainment the first movie i worked on was pursuit of happiness um that will start in i also worked on seven pounds and uh, I worked on the majority of the films that he was involved in for pretty much a 10-year stretch. So everything from Pursuit of Happiness, Seven Pounds, Hancock, um, the Karate Kid remake, After Earth, and Annie. And it was incredible to have the opportunity to work with him in that capacity. And on Pursuit of Happiness, I mean, that film to this day is still one of my favorite films, one of the most inspirational films I've ever seen. And his performance was so good. And I'll never forget the first time I saw the movie, I, uh, as an executive, put together a whole marketing and publicity campaign on how to take the message of faith in that film to the faith-based audience. And that, it, once we executed it, it became very successful and really contributed to the success of that film. And that really laid a foundation for me of starting to combine you know, my passion for faith and my passion for films. So, Devon, your your career is kind of in an arc where, you know, you spent 10 years working with Will Smith, and there was faith components to these films, uh, but now you're in kind of a new era. You are doing movies that are explicitly faith-based, and I think, for example, of a movie like Heaven is for Real that you had a very active role in, that was um, kind of a... I guess you could almost call it a sleeper movie. I mean, it was the the book that it was based on was a bestseller, and so there was a built-in audience for it. And you had a good, you know, you had an amazing director, Randall Wallace, who right. had done a lot of really big movies, and you had a good cast and all of that. So, I mean, you had all of the ingredients in place, but I don't think anybody anticipated that this movie was going to do over $100 million. No, they? no, nobody. Nobody saw that coming. That was a complete shock, and people are still shocked to this day. <laughs> well, and one of the reasons I think that it worked as well as it did was because of all of those elements. Is that what a producer does? Is the, is the job of a producer to kind of put those elements together yeah I mean you can't guarantee an outcome but no. if you put the right people and maybe the right ingredients together you can increase the likelihood of an outcome no you know I mean the thing about it is that it is a producer's job you know my job to find the material develop the material and then you know put all the pieces together so finding the right director uh, helping assist with the casting and teeing it all up you know putting all the right you know pieces in place for success 
is a very important part of the process. And on Heaven is for Real, I did that as an executive. And, um, you know, we didn't know. We didn't know. I mean, we knew the book was big. We knew people responded to the movie, but we had no idea. So we all were shocked at uh, how incredible that movie was and how successful that movie was. You know, and then when I did Miracles from Heaven a few years later, uh, that did very well. And the thing about it, to your question about, you know, explicitly faith-based, all these are based on true stories. So that also matters a tremendous amount because it's not the same of just saying, oh, let's go create an idea so we can explore these themes. It's like, no, this actually happened. You know, this young boy did almost die and had a near-death experience. That happened. This young girl had an incurable stomach condition, fell down the inside of a tree, hit her head three times, was trapped, and when she came out of it, the disease was gone. And she talked about her trip to heaven. In breakthrough, you know, this boy really did fall through the ice, was trapped for 15 minutes, died, was dead for another 45 minutes, and it was his mother's prayers that brought him back to life. So what I love about true stories that can do that, you can just tell the story. So that's all I do. I just tell the story. I don't try to impose, you know, my own um, message on it. I just try to unearth the message that's already in the true story so that audiences can understand that and then apply it to their own life. Shane Morris here again. I hope you're enjoying Warren Cole Smith's interview with Hollywood film producer, preacher, and motivational speaker, Devon Franklin. We'll get back to them in just a moment. This year marks the 10th anniversary of what Chuck Colson called one of the most important documents produced by the American church in his lifetime, the Manhattan Declaration, in defense of marriage, human life, and religious liberty. We've invited a number of Christian thinkers, including Professor Robert George of Princeton, David Dockery, Johnny Erickson Tata, and more, to share their insights on the Manhattan Declaration at our Breakpoint online symposium. Check them out at breakpoint.org. Now back to Warren Cole Smith's interview with Devon Franklin. So if, if there is, um, you know, a Devon Franklin brand, is that the brand that you are looking for stories that you're trying to tell? I would say, you know, my brand is inspiration, you know, to tell inspirational stories that can, uh, you know, uplift the world. And so, yes, that is a big part of the brand. And, and so, you know, with that spectrum of inspiration, there's a lot of different con- pieces of content that can fit that. Uh, not everything is going to be, you know, miracles from heaven. You know, on the inspirational, um, you know, spectrum, I have projects that are, you know, big CGI movies called The Garden, which is the story of, uh, you know, the Garden of Eden that we're doing kind of in a Jungle Book style. You know, I obviously have Breakthrough. I have another film that I'm doing next called Flamin' Hot, which is the creator about the creator of Flamin' Hot Cheetos, who was a Mexican janitor that worked for the company. You know, I have all kinds of movies that I do. Because I believe that it's important to expand what people think is inspirational. And that's a big part of uh, my brand, for sure. Well, I'm wondering, uh, based on where you say, I mean, on the one hand, maybe talking to Devon Franklin about the state of Hollywood and the state of, you know, Christians in Hollywood is not the best person to talk to with all due respect because <laughs> life's pretty good for Devon Franklin right now. Hilarious. <laughs> it seems to me. But but if you could step back from that, and I, don't, I know you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you, but how is it right now? I mean, do you, do you is this a good time for Christians to be making movies, a good time for Christians to be in Hollywood, or is it a tough time, or is it both? You know, I can only speak from my experience, and I think that, um, you know, being Christian in Hollywood is great. From the moment I set foot in Hollywood a 22 years ago, I have always been open about my beliefs, and I've always, there's always been a place here. And oddly enough, you know, Hollywood on some level has been more embracing than certain uh, areas of the church. And I have experienced in Hollywood that when you are authentic, organic, and you also put in the work, that there is a place for you. I think that uh, sometimes where, you know, Christians can experience challenges from my experience have been when there isn't always the same commitment to their faith that there is to the work. And so I think when you put the same commitment to the work that you put to your to our faith, we can find success. No matter how many doors may close, there's going to be a door that's open. And so I do think today and now is a good time to be Christian in Hollywood. And um, and I think that's going to mean something for everybody, different for everyone that, that, that is Christian in Hollywood. Um, but I think it's a great time, and there's tremendous opportunity for sure. 
Devon, I want to pivot a little bit in our conversation, if I could, and talk to you about your work as an author. You've had a book on the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah. Uh, is that a, a passion of yours? Is it something that you think yeah, you I love? Yeah, I love, you know, I did not know that I was going to love writing, but um, I do. And I'm on my fourth book. My first book was Produced by Faith. My second book was The Weight, which I wrote with my wife, um, Megan. The third book was uh, The Success Commandments. And um, the fourth book is The Truth About Men, which recently came out. And um, I love the opportunity to write because what it does is um, it gives me an opportunity to reach people in a different way than movies. And also what happens is that the books build the audience. And so I'm able to go out and talk to you know my audience on an annual basis, whether I have a movie or not, because I'm in conversation with them, helping them in their spiritual life, their professional life, and then their relational life. And those three areas are the areas that they come to me for guidance, for expertise. And the books really give me an opportunity to do that on a mass level. I'm grateful that I've been successful as an author and I have some ideas that I want to keep doing. My hope is to do a book every other year and a movie every year. Uh, and then we'll see where, you know, the TV show is going to fit into all that. So talk to me a little about your writing process. Um, I, whenever I have an author, I often like to ask that question. I mean, yeah. do you, when you're in a book, do you write every day for a hunt? You know, do you like put 500 words or an hour on, or do you once a week, or do you go away for a month and write the book at one time and, and then pass it off to editors and others? Or how, how does that work for you? It's chaos. I don't, I'm not a very regimented writer. I basically write on, I have the ideas that, are ruminating for a very long time and then once it you know I'm on the deadline of like okay here's when you have to deliver that's when uh, I start to put you know the process together I usually have a co-author who helps me with the structure and kind of lay out the book and the chapters and whatnot and then you know I uh, usually what will happen is we'll walk through the book talk through the ideas do a couple days of that and then um, those sessions will be transcribed he'll he takes the transcriptions and usually starts to lay out the chapters, then uh, he'll send them to me and then I do the rewrites on them. And, you know, when we're, you know, on a deadline, I mean, you know, sometimes it's it's writing in the evenings, it's taking a couple days off during the week, it's taking weekends off. It just really depends. But uh, it's usually specific to the book. Like when I'm not on a deadline, I'm not writing down ideas and thoughts. But it usually is, uh, you know, once it's time to deliver, that's when the process really begins. Well, in some ways, I think I can see the movie producer in that process, right? Yeah. Where, which is much more, I mean, a lot of times people think about writing as a solitary process where they're sitting, you know, sort of alone, sweating right. blood with a, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, with a quill pen over some parchment, right? But for you, it feels like that that's much more of a collaborative process, which, of course, is the movie process. The movie totally. process is a very collaborative totally. process. Totally, yeah. No, I love collaborating, and uh, it really, it's, it help, it's helpful. And also with doing so many uh, things, um, you know, having collaboration in every area that I'm in is, is, is essential because I don't know that I have the bandwidth alone to do it all by myself. So getting the help in each area is um, essential um, in order for, um, you know, me to, to operate according to my potential and purpose. Devon, I finally want to get to what uh, I'm yes. guessing you want to talk about, which is your movie Breakthrough. Can you tell me about that movie and sort of how it came into being? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Breakthrough. I was on the uh, promotional trail for Miracles from Heaven. And, you know, as I was there on a TV program on TBN, the Smith family, Joy Smith, John Smith, and Pastor Jason Noble were there telling their story. And backstage, as I heard their story, I was like, wait a minute, this is unbelievable. I think I got to tell this story. So I went to them and told them I wanted to help them tell their story in the form of a book and a movie. And um, we started talking about it. And the story is, you know, very straightforward. It's uh, John was 14 years old, was playing on a frozen lake. It began to crack. He fell through the ice and he was trapped underneath the ice for 15 minutes without oxygen. And they miraculously were able to find him. They took him to the hospital. They tried to revive him another 45 minutes. They could not do it. They go to his mother. And they tell her, uh, now's the time to say goodbye to your son. We've tried to bring him back, but we can't. We failed. And she goes in the emergency room, and instead of saying goodbye, she begins to pray loudly and ultimately says, Holy Spirit, bring back my son. And next thing you know, her son gets his heartbeat back. And that's the beginning of a miraculous recovery that medicine has never seen. In the medical note from the doctor, it says, patient dead, mother prayed, patient came back to life. And since they have, um, you know, done research to try to find another case of someone who is without oxygen for that long to recover the way John did. He has he's 18 years old now, no brain damage, no lung damage, no eye damage, pretty much no evidence of what he went through. 
and they have not been able to find another case in the world of someone with those uh, you know circumstances that is in the shape that John is in now. So it is a bona fide miracle of the highest order, and uh, that is the breakthrough story. Chrissy Metz from This Is Us stars in, in the in the movie. She plays an incredible. She plays Joyce. She does an incredible job. Uh, Roxanne Dawson is the director, um, and then we have an all-star cast to support Chrissy. We have Josh Lucas. Uh, who plays the father, Topher Grace, who plays the pastor, Dennis Haysbert, who plays Dr. Garrett, Mike Coulter, who plays Tommy Shine, and um, Marcel Ruiz, who plays John Smith. Yeah, well, that is an all-star cast. Many of those I'm big fans of, by the yeah. way, especially uh, Dennis Haysbert. I was a big fan of him, although going all the way back to uh, uh, 24. 24. Yeah, yeah, the president. Yeah. Yep. yeah, he was the president in 24. So that's great. I, I want to just push on you a little bit, though, Devon. I mean, there's going to be folks who are going to look at that story, and they're going to say – I don't know. Even many Christians might say, I'm skeptical. I mean, how do you know this was a real miracle? I mean, clearly something happened, but how do you know it was really a miracle? What would you say to those folks? You know, just listen to the doctors. I mean, the doctors that were there with their own eyes said, this is a miracle. Both doctors that were involved uh, said that. I mean, literally in the medical record, it says patient dead, mother prayed, patient came back to life. Those are the facts. So if someone were to not want to look at the facts, that's their choice. That's okay. But the facts are very compelling and uh, inspiring as well. Well, you know, I'm a fan of a lot of the actors that you just mentioned, but I also know that some of them are probably not Christians. Yeah. How do they respond to the story? They love it. That's why they wanted to do it. I mean, they were so connected to this movie. Uh, that's what inspired them to do it. Each one, each person in this film has an emotional attachment to this film that went beyond just a job for them. It was something personal, and that's amazing to be able to produce a story that would allow a personal connection like that with so many incredible actors. Yeah. Final question. Um, I hope you have many years ahead of you, uh, Devon, in, in Thank Hollywood you. I do too. as a writer, as a, as a husband, and as yeah. a dad. But, um, you know, you're a Christian. You know Scripture. You know that the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. Your own dad passed away at an yeah. early age. Um, yeah. What do you want the world to say about you when you're gone? Oh, my goodness. Wow. You know, that um, I live with faith. You know, I was a follower of Christ, and uh, I did the best I could to make the world a better place. Yeah, I think that would be that would be just fine. Devon Franklin, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Warren. You've been listening to an interview Warren Cole Smith originally conducted with Devon Franklin for Listening In, a weekly program of World News Group. To learn more about Listening In, go to wng.org slash listening in. And thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris.